We're in the Sumter National Forest, and I'm speaking with Nicole Haler, who is the director of the Chattooga Conservancy. And what is the Chattooga Conservancy? Chattooga Conservancy is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect, promote, and restore the Chattooga River watershed. Okay. Uh, and is this the Chattooga River right here? It certainly is. This is section two of the Chattooga River, running wild and free. And that is the West Fork of the Chattooga, one of the main tributaries. And we are standing um, amongst the reason we came up today, which is something I've just started to learn about, which is our native bamboo. Native river cane. And we're in, in the midst of a native cane restoration project in cooperation with the Andrew Pickens Ranger District of the Sumter National Forest uh -huh. and a project partner revitalization of traditional Cherokee artisan resources in the eastern band of the Cherokee Indians to try and recreate 29 acres of native river cane habitat which is one of the most endangered ecosystems in the southeast. But they used to be 10 million acres. Not anymore. <laughs> it's it's been uh, um, due to um, agricultural uses and just general development in the southeast. There's not much of it left. Okay. And so y'all have gotten funding and partners to try to restore 29 acres, um, and which, you know, if you're thinking about planting corn and soybeans and things like that sounds very minor, but this is a delicate thing to deal with. Yes, it is. The science of restoring river cane habitat is um, still um, largely unknown. Or it, There are a lot of people studying various aspects of it from um, soil conditions um, to the use of prescribed fire um, to how to transplant it and different um, um, materials, higher quality cane to transplant versus lower quality cane to transplant. So there's really um, a lot of unknown out there. So we're uh, having to go at it right here. And we know that if we look over this way, we know that um, there was at one time a village of Cherokee people who probably came in and used this all the time. Absolutely. That's one reason why we were drawn to this area for the project is there's existing cane right here next to the Chattooga River and there was probably quite a bit more at one time and um, most Cherokee uh, Indian villages in the Chattooga watershed they are known where they were and a lot of times you'll find a nice stand of native cane or some population of native cane next to the Indian village because they use it for a lot of um, um, cultural and practical purposes like basket weaving and so forth. And this site was called the, it had a name? Chattooga Old Town. Chattooga Old Town. Yes. Well, thank you so much for bringing me out here, and um, I'd like to come back and learn more about this, and I am going to speak with some other people who came today who um, are studying different aspects of River King. Thanks. Robert, you're a forest ecologist, among many other things, and we're in a pretty nice stand of River Cane. I've read things about when you were a little boy just getting lost in it. But tell me about River Cane and its history in our continent, please. Okay, yeah. When I was I was a kid in on the Sandy River in Chester County, I, I was in places like this. Actually it was even denser than this. I mean, I would be lost for thirty minutes Ooh. going and through it. That's how dense it was and how extensive it was. And now River Cane is reduced by about ninety eight percent. And and Based on Lawson, John Lawson, and, and William Bartram, and what they wrote about in the 1600s and 1700s, you know, there were extensive areas of river cane along the rivers. Uh, when you got to the coast, there was a different species, uh, a Rundinaria tecta. This is Rundinaria gigantea. But still, there was cane. There was a river cane found all the way up to New York, and then throughout the southeast, even up into Oklahoma, and then then south into Texas. Now, there were 10 million acres of that, but like 100 million acres of longleaf. So what did river cane need to be established? What, what was it looking for ecologically? Well, yeah, it, it likes to be in wet areas, not saturated all the time. Uh -huh. They like to be flooded, and that provides some extra nutrients for them, and they actually help the river because they, they reduce the sediment that goes into the river. So they're really important for that. 
So they had their little niche here, not right at the uh, right at the edge of the floodplain where the water is there all uh -huh. the time, but in the parts of the floodplain that were a little bit drier. So they would get water. They would get the roots saturated for part of the year. Then the other parts of the year, it would be drier. In fact, it would be dry enough for fire to occasionally go through the cane. And there's, there's some theories that that possibly was, uh, was beneficial to them because Bartram talked about, and, and John Lawson talked about, the Native Americans would burn the cane. You could hear it, hear it exploding because it sounded like firecrackers. Because you can see right here, this is filled with air. So when it would heat up in the fires, it would, yeah, it would explode. Boom, yeah. So they know the, the Native Americans would do that some. Well, and they would do that because there was game in there? Well, it could be because there's game in there. And also, uh, they were pretty good ecologists. Uh -huh. They probably had an idea that this is a species that needed some disturbance. Now, you don't need it every year, but of it needed course. some disturbance. Mm -hmm. And actually, the, the river provided that disturbance because we didn't have dams back then. So, you know, when it would rain a lot, you didn't have the dam holding back the water, it would flood. And it would scour out parts of the floodplain and take out some of the trees and then river cane could get started. Because it wants sun, sunlight. Yeah, it yeah. wants sunlight. It can do okay under partial shade, but it really likes the full sunlight. All that really old pictures from the early 1900s of really tall river cane, kind of like we have here, it's all out in open sunny areas. Well, you said it was good for stabilizing the soil. I've read that it was better at preventing sediment than just trees and shrubs. It is better because it, it gets so dense, so dense that it, it slow, forces the water to slow down. When it slows down, then the water will drop the sediment. So it help, helps to keep the water in the river clean, provides nutrients for the soil. And that's really important because Native Americans, you know, they like to farm. Most yes. of the time it was by the rivers. And it's even possible that their farmer practices benefited cane because when they abandoned a the field, which they would do fairly often, then river cane could come in there. Because uh -huh. it can spread fairly rapidly with rhizomes. You know, uh -huh. it's, a, it's an underground stem. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes the best way for river cane to reproduce is vegetatively. And that means that that underground stem is going to sprout and then it can reproduce that way. Now it does produce seeds, and but it's a uh, it's a really odd, odd ecology because it will flower every anywhere from three to 50 years. And does it die like bamboo and other after places? It, after it blooms, it, it can die, yes. And the, it makes the seeds, but the seeds are, aren't very viable. So oftentimes, if they land in the right spot, then they're not going to germinate or they have very low germination rates. Mm -hmm. So the best way is vegetatively. Uh -huh. And then there also, there's going to be some that comes back from seed. Well, what did it do for animals back in the day when it was so extent and so thick? There were a lot of species that used it. Uh, deer would hide in it. You can, you can see here, it's pretty dense. And this one is not that dense. I've been in much denser. So the deer can hide. Uh, the bear and the bison like to go in there during the hot summer days because it was cooler. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the bison may munch on some leaves and the bear may look for a deer. But there were birds also. Uh, Backman's warbler specialized on river cane. This is where it nested, and it's, it's now extinct. Oh. And then uh, Swainson's warbler, which we still have, shows a strong preference for river cane. Does it? Yes. And then there's six, six butterfly species that rely on cane. But it's the larval food source. Though? Yes. Yes. Good heavens. Yes. So, so they're ecologically very important. It's important for the animals. It's important for the soil. And it's important for uh, culturally also. So it's just a, a very important ecosystem that has declined 98%. And people don't get to do what I did as a kid and walk through that and it's, it's, like, a, it's like a mystery. Every time you push back some cane, you don't know what you're gonna find. What you're gonna find. Yeah, which for me, when I, I was a kid, that was just a lot of fun. Yeah. Or who's gonna find you. Or who's gonna find me, <laughs> that's right, yeah. Those bears that are still out here. Yeah. yeah I wish, yeah, that yeah. would be great to have them all over the place in the river cane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there, yeah. well let's not see one today, or at least not up <laughs> <Yeah>. close. <laughs> Robert, thank you so much. This you're has been welcome. fascinating. Adam Griffith, you are an extension agent like me, <laughs> but you have a pretty fascinating assignment associated with river cane. 
I do. Um, my job is to make sure that Cherokee tribal artisans have the natural resources that they need to do what they do. And so I'm employed by the state of North Carolina as an extension agent, but my job is paid for by the Cherokee Preservation Foundation. So I'm the director of something called the Revitalization of Traditional Cherokee Artisan Resources, which is a mouthful, but it's an absolutely wonderful job and I love it. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the people that you're dealing with mostly are doing things that are decorative or relatively small, like blowguns or things. But tell me traditionally how massively the use was of river cane in everything that not only the Cherokee but other tribes did as well. Dr. Charles Hudson summed it up very well when he called river cane the plastic of southeastern native tribes. And so it was used for virtually everything from the walls of the homes that they lived in to the fish creels that they used to catch fish in to the blow guns that you mentioned for hunting small game, the basketry, uh, the river cane mats where food was prepared and served on, river cane mats for sleeping. It was in virtually all aspects of, of their lives. And there was a beautiful way of weaving it and I think they in, involved plant dyes to make it even more beautiful for some of the mattings and things. We also focus, RT Car also focuses on dye plants as well. And so, uh, yes, they, they, they wove these beautiful patterns uh, into a wide variety of objects. They use bloodroot, which is a white flower coming up right now. I have that in my yard. Sanguinaria <laughs> canadensis, right? So the sanguine is French for blood. Um, you've got uh, black walnut, yes. uh, white walnut, which is butternut. Uh, yellow root, and these were the mm -hmm. primary dye plants. And okay. so we also focus on, uh, on, on those uh, species as well. And so now that we're down to like 2% of the original 10 million acres, these artisans, I don't think, aren't they having trouble finding enough of this? They absolutely are. And they're having to drive further and further from Cherokee. So they're driving out of state, and so my role is to help them find the natural resources that they need. But RT Carr and the Cherokee Preservation Foundation also fund nonprofit organizations to carry out this work. An example of that is the Chattooga Conservancy, where we're seating uh, in, in this land on the National Forest. Um, and so they have done excellent work restoring river cane uh, to this landscape. We also work with a wide variety of other nonprofit partners and are actually seeking partners in the upstate of South Carolina now where river cane naturally grows. Oh, where it was, or uh, suitable sites and perhaps. So how are you going to get, you said in this site, you can, you're hoping to have 29 acres replanted and you're going to find nice healthy clumps that are a good size and move them when appropriate to other places, but there's not enough to do that all over. How are you going to grow it? And I've heard it's hard, kind of hard to grow. That's true. It's, uh, it can be a little finicky. It's a grass, uh, and so you can transplant it simply by digging it up and moving it from one location to the other. We don't condone moving it hundreds of miles uh, for genetic reasons. Certainly. However, tens of miles, I think, is, is perfectly acceptable. And so the challenge, uh, as Robert mentioned previously, is that river cane only flowers and produces seeds so sporadically that we can't really harvest them. These were harvested in 2004 uh, from Gadua outside of Bryson City. And that's the main reason that we're digging up clumps of river cane. When we dig up the clumps of the river cane, we're targeting a patch of ground that has between three and eight stems, three and eight culms, yes. and we're digging in a circle maybe 18 to 24 inches in diameter of soil and 10 to 12 inches down to try Ooh. to capture the rhizomes uh, uh, in a, 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 a very long length, right? The longer the length of the rhizome, the, the, the better the survival rate will be for this clump of plants. Okay. Yeah, and so we're transplanting during the time of the year when the plant is dormant over the winter uh, February is, is probably the best month for transplanting. Um, and so we're, we're digging up. I did an Eagle Scout project last weekend with a young man in, um, in Buncombe County. And so we're uh, actively transplanting river cane in, in multiple locations. And we were fortunate enough at the Cherokee Tribal Greenhouse with David Anderson to receive a large amount of river cane from Warren Wilson College in Western North Carolina. And so yeah. we're, we're using that to distribute amongst tribal members. Where the Cherokee are living right now, I believe is not 
particularly conducive to growing river cane? Is that why we're trying to find, you're trying to find other places and they'll be allowed to harvest with the proper procedures and all in those places eventually? That's exactly right. A large part of what RTCAR does is manage memorandums of understanding with private landowners and nonprofit partners to allow Cherokee tribal artisans to come harvest on their land. Um, if the natural resource, if the river cane is not large enough or of interest to the artisans, uh, we keep an eye on it, I keep an eye on it, and we look, and in the future maybe it will develop into a natural resource uh, that, that can, be, can be used for tribal uh, artisans. And I would imagine that these aging artisans in some case would like to pass their skills on so it becomes even more critical that there is enough material because people who are learning are gonna, not going to turn out the most beautiful basket the first time. They need a little bit to experiment with. It's actually very impressive. They've reintroduced the curriculum into the Cherokee uh, high school art program really? in Cherokee. And actually, so, there are some really impressive baskets coming out. If you really want to see some of them, come back at the Cherokee Fair this fall. It happens in October every year. And some of the really nice baskets are from the high school art program. And in fact, we just funded them, RT Car and the CPF just funded them with uh, the ability to purchase some materials for their, for their classroom. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the size of what's positively good, what's good and what isn't as right. useful. Right, and so the phrase that has been used a few times uh, today earlier was high quality river cane. Yes. And so when I look around here, I see a lot of potential but I see a lot of bushy river cane, meaning that there's a lot of light in the area. For river cane to develop into a really highly sought after natural resource for the artisans uh, and possibly blow guns, this diameter river cane would be suitable oh, for blow guns. Uh -huh. uh, we need low light levels. And so the river cane patch must get very dense, oh. right? So the taller individuals, the taller combs are reaching for that light. Yes. They're not producing the branches Yes. Uh, until very close to the top canopy layer, and uh, that that enables uh, that facilitates that makes use the, by the diameter tribal. larger. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. I've just scratched the surface, but I want to thank all of you who are here today to help us start to understand this remarkable resource. You're welcome, and thanks for the opportunity.